Welcome to Econ 102. This is the online version for Tuesday's class. I'm sorry I can't be with you here today. Uh, Virginia Robertson, Leslie, my wife's uh, grandmother, passed away. She was 104. She lived a fantastic life. She lived at home until the very end. Uh, and uh, if you can live to be 104 and be surrounded by family uh, when the end came, uh, that's a great, great life. She'll be greatly missed. Um, and I'm down in Virginia at the moment. Uh, at her funeral. So uh, I've assembled a lot of things here for you to look at in, in lieu of uh, the actual classroom experience. So please pay attention. The idea here is that I'm going to go through a number of the last uh, PowerPoints that you have. Uh, if you don't have the PowerPoint packet, you can just copy down the information and, and then of course rewind the tape uh, to see exactly what I'm talking about here in the last part of the chapter. Uh, and at times I'm going to direct you to my website as well to look at videos there since I've already uh, created some video content that we can use uh, to round out the rest of Chapter 3. So let me get started. Um, first thing I want to do is uh, ask you to watch the Hudsucker Proxy. It's on my website, uh, and I'll provide a link on Angel, and also I'll post this on the Facebook group. So watch the film clip now. Watch it, right? So you can pause this, and then watch the video clip, and then come back. Okay. You've watched the Hudsucker Proxy. All right, now, it's a very interesting clip about the advent of the hula hoop craze. Um, so what I'd like to do right now, since you've watched the clip, is I'd like to show you how we can model the Hudsucker Proxy using supply and demand curves. So here we go. There's a price for the hula hoop. And there would be the number of hula hoops sold. We always do what? Put the price here, put the quantity here, because price and quantity are part of the definitions of demand and supply. So here we go. In the clip, what's the first price you saw? Remember it? $1.79, right? What do we see happening at $1.79? There's the toy store owner, and there aren't any kids showing up. So $1.79 is not the magic price, and if nobody's buying the hula hoop, then you have to lower the price, right? So we see the price falling and falling and falling and falling, and eventually the price gets all the way down to $0.25, cents, free with any purchase, and then the toy store owner is so disgusted with the hula hoops that he throws them out into the alleyway. One hula hoop escapes, goes out into the street, around the corner, rolls down the sidewalk, finds the kid who's skipping school. The kid is amazingly good at the hula hoop, and all of a sudden a throng of kids who are out of school see this kid doing cool things with the hula hoop, and they immediately run to the toy store, right? And it's at that moment that the toy store owner realizes he had something really good, retrieves most of them from the alleyway, and he starts jacking up the price, right? all the way until we get to $3.99. So what we have to do is somehow take all this information and process this, right, uh, in a way that we can do with demand and supply curves. So I'm going to start with the demand curve, and I'm going to argue that demand in the beginning for loops was very low. So here's my original demand curve. That's not much demand, okay? And I'm going to argue that he had lots of hula hoops on hand, so the supply was pretty big. So here's the supply. Looks like this. Standard upward sloping supply curve, downward sloping demand curve. And so when in the beginning we see the price is falling, the only thing that's changing is the price, which means there's a change in the quantity demanded. So we slide along the demand curve, right? So we're sliding down along the demand curve, and the price keeps falling and falling and falling. In fact, you can't give them away, right? Nobody wants them. Why is that the case? Well, there are more hula hoops supplied at a zero price than the number of people who wish to buy them, right? And if supply is greater than demand, well then he had originally a surplus of hula hoops, which would indicate actually you have to pay people um, to take a hula hoop out of the store, right? The actual equilibrium would be way down here below zero. Of course, nobody can make money if you had to pay people to buy hula hoops. So that's where we found ourselves uh, in the clip. The price has collapsed. The hula hoop was worthless. 
but something changed. And when something changes, well, that's a violation of Ceteris Paribus. In this case, from what we had learned in Thursday's class, the uh, consumer's tastes and preferences had changed. And all of a sudden, something was in style, right? Something was fashionable that wasn't fashionable before, and there's the hula hoop craze is born. And we would evidence that by saying that there was a sudden spurt or increase in demand. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the new demand curve after the hula hoop craze. And demand all of a sudden shifts out a lot because a whole bunch of kids want to buy these. So here's my new demand curve. It's big, right? Everybody wants a hula hoop. And so all of a sudden we find ourselves up here. Now, now what was that? That's going to be the new equilibrium price. And that's E2. And my scale's not very good right here. But the idea was, at the end of the scene, we see that the price is $3.99. How do we get to $3.99? Because if you're a merchant who sells toys, well, you're going to raise the price as long as you possibly can. And so as you do that, well, you move back up along the supply curve, and we find a point where the number of hula hoops that you had on hand was exactly equal to the number of kids who actually wanted to buy a hula hoop. So that's how we evidence what's going on in the scene. In the beginning, the only thing that's changing is the price, so we slide along the curve, then there's this sudden shift in preferences, the entire demand curve shifts out from D1 to D2, that brings us to a new equilibrium price, and that's the 399 that we see at the end. I hope this has been helpful because the idea behind that scene is that it helps you to keep straight when you would slide along a curve as opposed to when you would, would shift a curve. It's one of the central ideas uh, that we worry about here in Chapter 3. Okay, so let's cross that off because that's the Hudsucker problem.